Hello and welcome to The Point World Affairs, I'm Cha Sang-mi. Online posts that incite racism, sexism or terrorism are all very serious social problems emerging in the digital age. How are countries around the world, including Korea, responding to this growing issue? To help us learn more, we have with us attorney at law Kim Young-jun, a partner at Milbank Tweed, Hadley and McCloy. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's first take a look at this short clip. Prior to the midterm elections in late October, a series of bomb packages were delivered to members of the Democratic Party. Caesar Sayak, who was arrested as a suspect in the case, posted articles from a far-right news source and messages criticizing Muslims in his social media account. Robert Bowers, who was also convicted of shooting 11 people in a Pennsylvania synagogue, is also an avid user of the ultra-right social media Gap.com. It has been reported that he posted anti-Semitism posts many times. The vile, hate-filled poison of anti-Semitism must be condemned and confronted everywhere and anywhere it appears. The influence of social media has been confirmed behind the events that shocked the U.S. and the international community. However, most countries are currently lacking legal grounds to punish discriminatory or hate comments made on social network unless they lead to actual crimes in the real world. Therefore, global social media firms are being heavily criticized for indiscriminately distributing false information, hateful content, controlling users' thoughts and behaviors, and distorting democracy as a result. In response to the criticisms, these social media firms say they are trying to utilize artificial intelligence and human resources to purge inappropriate content from their sites. But as an increasing number of people are getting addicted to the spread of fake news and discriminatory and hateful expressions, many are saying that strong regulations should be imposed to these offenders. On the other hand, there is also considerable opposition that regulations can be abused as a means to suppress freedom of expression and the press. There is also skepticism over whether or not it is fundamentally possible to solve the issue of false rumors and irresponsible use of social media. On this week's The Point World Affairs, we look into the impact of discriminatory and hateful expressions on social media and the controversy surrounding regulatory measures. So, Mr. Kim, why is expressing these kind of hatred speech, especially um, regarding sexism or racism, so more important online than in real life? Let me put them in two, two categories. One is uh, the nature of Internet-related uh, messages. Number one, uh, most messages online are anonymous, so the bad actors hide behind their messages, so you don't know who they are. They um, uh, tend to say vile things that they would not say at people's face. Number two, because of the Internet, the sp uh, messages spread extremely fast. Number three, uh, again, because of the nature of the internet, the messages, no matter how true or false, um, no matter how distant uh, uh, from the incident that generated the message, can never be really erased uh, truly. So those are the three characteristics of messages online versus offline. But also the human nature plays a big part. Uh, let's say uh, human nature dictates that good messages don't get spread quite as fast as bad messages. What I mean by that is, let's say you wake up in the morning and say, what a beautiful day today. Um, I feel so great today. You, let's say you post that message on, online. Nobody's going to retweet that because uh, what's a big deal? But when you wake up in the morning and say, can you believe that crazy idiot who said such and such thing yesterday? It makes me so mad. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether that's true or not, instantly that's going to get what happened. And then it's going to get spread like wildfire. So that's generally the nature of a, negative news versus uh, good news and, uh, and because of the technology and anonymity involved in the internet that's uh, making the problem much more serious than offline discussion. So do you think these kind of offensive expressions and then the spread of these false information as well will actually affect the perception and the behavioral changes of the internet users? Yeah, so uh, be before 2016 I guess, which I guess is a kind of a tipping point in terms of discussion on this point, um, Generally, there are accepted norms of civility or civil behavior, but uh, unfortunately, especially in the United States, the people, uh, the person at the top of the political uh, food chain uh, basically has thrown out the norms of civility or civil discussion. And basically that emboldens a lot of people who were 
potentially on the borderline, uh, privately harboring some bad thoughts, but not really uh, going over the line in terms of uh, expressing those views, are now emboldened and not only emboldened, encouraged to express those views. And what used to be unacceptable uh, is now partly acceptable. And you see that instance of those uh, behavior uh, patterns manifesting themselves in uh, you know, Pittsburgh synagogue attack and uh, the mailing of pipe bombs uh, leading up to the uh, midterm elections. Um, so I definitely believe there's a clear connection between uh, hate speech and people uh, actually acting out their bad thoughts. Uh, you just mentioned about year 2016. So tell us why you see that as a turning point, as an important date for this. Yeah, because um, once you hear some message over and over and over again, no matter how most people disagree with it, your senses are dulled. Um, so what used to be totally shocking yesterday, it's not shocking anymore, but it's just a problematic. And day after tomorrow, it'll be not just problematic, but uh, it's one of those things. So eventually people are kind of inoculated in a bad sense uh, of the shocking effect of this bad behavior. So that's why the leadership is so important. But unfortunately, uh, uh, political leadership in the United States um, has degenerated into really bad discussion uh, and enabling bad behavior. And, you know, perhaps it's not unique to the United States. You see that in uh, various other advanced countries as well as middling countries uh, in Latin America as, as well. So it is uh, perhaps a problem of the global development stage at this point, um, but perhaps uh, it is part of the consequences of political development, rising inequality and all those things. But nevertheless, the problem is still there, basically enabled by this uh, uh, technology that was not available 10, 15 years ago. Okay, let's hear more opinions from the international experts. Let's connect to the U.S., where the spread of fake news and hate crimes are emerging as serious issues. Joining us is Professor Jerry Sepos, former dean of the Manship School of Mass Communication at Louisiana State University. Welcome, Professor. Hey, thank you very much. Glad to be here. The culprits of the shooting in Pittsburgh and the pre-election bombs that were delivered to politicians were confirmed to be connected to the negative views of social media. I think there's a lot of concerns within the U.S. about this. What is it like? Well, there, there certainly are concerns, but there's a, a countervailing concern, and that is, of course, the concern about uh, the First Amendment and the freedom to say what we want to say. And those are two uh, tremendously contradicting influences. And I don't think any of us want to say that there should be laws uh, regulating exactly what you can say on social media. But, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very tough situation, and I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, to tell you the truth. The U.S. government is now solely depending on the social media companies to regulate inappropriate contents within their platforms. So do you think this is enough? Some are saying that there is a need for a stronger government regulations. Well, there's a, there's a long history there. Uh, I was lucky enough to spend about 30 years of my career in Silicon Valley, where I learned about, uh, learned about uh, technology companies. And there was a strong feeling that technology companies should be free of government uh, intervention. And in fact, for many years, tech companies didn't even hire lobbyists in Washington, which was very unusual in American industry. All that has changed a lot. But my feeling is that we should be very, very careful about how we regulate tech companies, or for that matter, any other companies. Uh, you just talked about your decades-long experience in the Silicon Valley. So how are these tech giants responding to this uh, fast-changing regulations about social media? Well, as with every other industry, uh, different companies do different things. Uh, if I were running Facebook, I would say, boy, I need a new public relations advisor because things haven't gone very well. On the other hand, uh, many other companies have been forthright concerned, but forthright and admitting what their problems are. But I think Facebook has done a horrible job of telling any of us what the problems are. And uh, Facebook stands the chance for regulation, probably the best chance for regulation, if there is regulation, because it has not been forthcoming. And anyone will tell you the way to succeed is to be honest and forthcoming. And Facebook has not been. 
Thank you for your time today. That was Professor Seppos. Now, Mr. Kim, uh, there are portals like Naver in Korea and the social media platform like Kakao that are also beginning to regulate inappropriate contents to curb these problems, spreading fake news about gender or minority issues. Yes, I think it's a, certainly, a, I mean, a superficially good faith effort on the part of the companies to regulate or deal with the problem. But there's a fundamental um, built-in conflict in the business model of social media itself. What I mean by that is the users um, use the platform for free. Uh, of course, it's nothing is really ultimately free because society as a whole is paying the price of this issue. But uh, in, in, at least in terms of direct cost, it's free. Uh, then who pays for the uh, um, uh, social media platform business? It's the advertisers, third-party advertisers. So the majority of people who are using the uh, platform are products that the media companies are selling to the advertisers uh, without realizing it. So. Uh, whom are they going to listen to, the advertisers or the users? Uh, you, let's say you know, 10 most uh, uh, important companies uh, elected the congressional representatives uh, and people have complaints to the congressional representative. Do, do, you think, do you think they'll listen? Of course not. So that's why there's a misalignment of incentives between the uh, people who are raising the issues versus who are creating the problems uh, because the third party advertisers are basically paying the social media platform to manipulate and uh, modify vast majority of people's behavior and thoughts. And that's why no matter how big an army of uh, censors or reviewers you hire, uh, there's a built-in conflict. And that conflict is quite obvious when you uh, read some of the conversations that Zuckerberg had uh, with uh, Sheryl Sandberg, um, uh, as New York Times revealed uh, through anonymous sources. Um, they know what, what the business problem is, but they cannot fix it because it's basically destroying their own business model to truly face the problem. So that is the fundamental issue with the uh, uh, business model of the social media. Many countries are seeking solutions to how fake news and hate speech, which have become rampant on social media, are seriously affecting crime rates in real life. In Japan, online stalking, which entails repeatedly sending messages or blog posts despite being rejected by the other party, has become a punishable crime since last year. What's more, Germany, the largest economy in the EU, has been enforcing the Network Enforcement Act since last year, a law aimed at combating fake news on social media. The law requires social networking service providers such as Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to block offensive posts that users report or discover themselves within 24 hours and delete them within seven days. If violated, the firms must pay up to 50 million euros in fines. In Germany, there has been the so-called anti-discrimination law that prohibits incitement of hatred and slander of certain racial, ethnic and religious groups. But with many pointing out that the online sphere is a blind spot for the application of the law, this has led to the enactment of a law regulating the spread of fake news and hateful comments online. But why is it that opposition parties, civic groups and media organizations have been voicing out their criticism and disapproval during the course of legislation and in the enforcement of the law? Countries like Japan and Germany that have already enforced regulations on social media can be examples for other countries preparing relevant bills and solutions. Let's connect to experts from Japan and Germany to hear about the effectiveness of the regulations and the controversy surrounding it. In Japan, stalking someone on social media is also punishable by law. Joining us now is Professor Jiro Takai, Professor of Social Psychology at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development in Nagoya University. Welcome, Professor. Okay, thank you. Why did Japan enforce laws to regulate social media stalking? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, issues with social media, uh, which is a new uh, application, especially with a smartphone. Uh, people can connect anywhere, anytime, and they're, naturally you're going to have some problems with that. And it's, it's one of the social issues that have come up here uh, with, with stalking, as well as uh, uh, hate speech and uh, other ill effects that have uh, are probably commonly occurring elsewhere as well, not just in Japan. The law has been in effect for two years. Do you think it has been going well? As a psychologist, the social media regulation can actually help prevent these kind of uh, crimes. 
Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there has to be some kind of law uh, put into effect uh, as a deterrent. Uh, people could actually say anything they want. And uh, as, an, uh, as, as a result, a lot of people are going to get hurt by, those, uh, by, by people saying that. Uh, and, uh, I should add that uh, the criminal laws against hate speech are pretty lax here. Uh, it's, it's not going to give you uh, punishment through imprisonment. imprisonment. Uh, but it will give you, you could be liable to uh, defamation, uh, court cases and defamation. And the law will have uh, allow people to sue other people for this, uh, uh, for such hate speech, but uh, it, it will not put you into prison. So it's not a criminal law, it's a civil law. So this seems like global trend. It's happening everywhere worldwide. So how do you think uh, this will unfold the future prospects of this regulation uh, globally. With Japan, though, uh, people are not really, uh, people have been reluctant to express their views face to face, but now that it's through the SNS, they can express their views freely and uh, not really feel any remorse for it. And you're going to have people expressing their views, even views that they would not normally say to people if they were right in front of them. And, uh, and obviously, this is going to spread across from a, a a group of people that go beyond their personal uh, friends and people, other people from all over the world would see what they write through the Twitter. And uh, this has been something new. And we've had a lot of problems here, especially with university students who uh, take photographs of them fooling around and uh, breaking the laws, fooling around, uh, causing uh, vandalism, causing a lot of riots. Uh, this kind of activity they would take as a photograph and they put it up on the SNS, and people would see that. And you know, as a result, they, they, they just think that it's just their friends seeing it. But they don't realize that it's the whole world seeing it. And we've had some problems, uh, complaints against the university that your students have been doing this and that. And it, it's a shame to the university community. And the organization has to be held responsible for whatever actions they do on the SNS. And people are becoming aware of the fact that they are mass communicators and they're not communicating interpersonally. Uh, it goes beyond their group and it goes past uh, to the whole society and people have access to SNS freely, uh, especially if you have it internationally, it's going to be a shame if uh, they, they put the Japanese people to shame by doing silly things. Thank you. That was Professor Jiro Takai from Nagoya University. Let's go straight to an expert in Germany already known to have actually implemented regulatory laws regarding social media. We have with us Wolfgang Schulz, director of the Hans Bredow Institute for Media Research and chair for media and public law at the University of Hamburg. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Are issues like racism and sexism big problems in Germany? Tell us why the Network Enforcement Act was implemented. Uh, we had, though, some cases uh, that triggered uh, the act um, that uh, had to do with misinformation in election time and um, misinformation that concerns politicians. For example, we had the, the case that our chancellor, Angela Merkel, it, uh, took a selfie with a Syrian refugee, and the right-wing uh, person posted that online and claimed that this person is a terrorist, in fact, and that Merkel was stupid enough um, to take the selfie with a terrorist. That, of course, was complete nonsense. It was not true. Uh, and, of course, it's a violation of, of uh, the honor of, of the, the person and uh, maybe a violation of rights of, of the chancellor as well. Um, and that was one of the cases where people started wondering in Germany uh, whether we need a specific law to deal with that. And later on, there was an initiative um, to have that um, covered by self-regulation by the companies, but the government felt at the end um, that that was not effective uh, enough. I hear that there's a discussion about revision of this law uh, known as the Nets DG law in Germany. Uh, so how do you think this law should be revised uh, to, you know, to curb these kind of problems online uh, while not stifling uh, the problems, the freedom of expression? 
So as far as I know, there is uh, no decision made so far um, to what extent the law has to be revised. I think the government of Germany is uh, quite happy with that. Uh, we have had the first reports which show extent of, of the phenomenon because we have over 200,000 cases uh, under the law um, for YouTube, to take an example, uh, at the first half year in Germany. Um, I personally believe that uh, we should uh, refrain from uh, this kind of obligations for platforms um, in any cases where um, you have to make a very nuanced balancing to, because you have different interests. Thank you. That was Professor Wolfgang Schultz from University of Hamburg. Mr. Kim, so do you agree with the experts from Japan and from Germany? I think um, both indicate the difficulty of tackling this issue globally um, under uh, different contexts. Uh, for example, in Japan, I know uh, notwithstanding the strengthened law uh, regarding anti-stalking and porn revenge laws, um, I read, uh, according to Japan Times, the incidence of those uh, bad behavior has actually increased last two years even after the passage of the law. In Germany, I think because of the uh, nightmare of a Nazism, uh, I think there's a much strengthened and much more uh, broad national consensus as to uh, uh, the wish to root out this hate speech and so forth. So I think uh, I understand there's altogether about 87 percent uh, approval rate among the uh, general population in Germany for this uh, Nazi DZ law. According to um, a survey, a similar law would have the support of a uh, great majority of people in France, in the UK, even in the United States. But what's interesting is in the United States, uh, about 65% or so would approve a similar measure, but only 49% would strongly approve, which is, is less than majority. Um, because in the United States, there's a very strong First Amendment tradition, uh, which is uh, not uh, present in, in, even in uh, advanced countries in Europe. Even in the UK, uh, sharing the same Anglo-American jurisprudence, uh, it's much easier to uh, sue for libel defamation in the, in the UK versus uh, being almost impossible in the United States. So, you know, you see a lot of tabloid news uh, uh, papers in, in supermarket uh, checkout counters in the United States. Uh, let's say Prince Charles was visited by Martian alien or whatever, uh, but nobody can actually uh, claim a defamation suit on that. So that's the First Amendment tradition in the United States, uh, which also indicates uh, uh, general population's belief in uh, free speech as much as possible. So those are same difficulties, but different countries have different uh, contexts in which uh, they, uh, they try to regulate. Again, fundamentally, I go back to the same point about misalignment of interest. Uh, the payor controls the social media platform and the users don't have control over the social media company. So I do have actually a radical solution uh, just to facilitate the debate, which is you actually make users pay for posting, um, even if it's the one cent uh, uh, posting, one cent uh, for a photo. I know it goes against the grain of the nature of the Internet, which was supposed to make the world flat and everybody should have access to it. And it also has a problem then one dollar, one vote versus one person, one vote. But nevertheless, if somebody has to pay even one cent or even a fraction of a penny for posting something combined with a real name uh, instead of anonymity, can guarantee you it'll go a long way in solving the problem because there is then an alignment of interest and cost-benefit analysis uh, between the user and the platform. But how about is there an international criteria for deciding, distinguishing a free speech and a hate speech? Is there one? Well, it's a fine line between regulating hate speech versus uh, you know regulating press freedom. Um, so. Uh, most advanced countries are really low to go that, down that route. But because of the rising uh, uh, just prevalence of and, and you know, superficial acceptance of hate, hateful speech in advanced countries, um, the idea of somehow coming up with some sort of regulatory mechanism to control that is, uh, is rising. But um, I don't think it's going to be a committee of uh, you know, employees uh, at Facebook. I don't think it's going to be a committee of people at Google. I don't think it's going to be a committee of people in Congress even. Um, there's a very interesting or depressing scene in the Judiciary Committee hearing in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, um, when Zuckerberg was uh, being grilled and then uh, this senator, um, uh, I won't name him, basically said, I don't understand your business model, so how do you make money because nobody's paying for it? And then, the, and then Zuckerberg was, had this stunned look saying, Senator, um, that's why we have advertising. And then the senator was like dumbfounded. As, Oh, I guess. So it goes to show the, you can't really rely on the politicians to come up with the best regulation either. But 
uh, I believe there's something called consensus as to what is right or is wrong in terms of hateful, not hateful. Um, just to cite a U.S. Supreme Court opinion uh, defining pornography, one uh, justice basically said, you cannot define it, but I know it when I see one. So I know people are saying it's really difficult to define what is hateful, what is not, but deep down inside, people will know. So if you kind of uh, uh, grab onto that and come up with some uh, pan-societal committee or whatever group who can actually judge these things, um, you know, uh, some sort of an ombudsman uh, that can decide cases on, on, on this uh, uh, difficult topic, it can be done. But I don't think it's going to be entrusted to committees within the companies uh, of social media business. Okay, thank you very much for your very interesting insights today. Thank you. Malicious comments and posts that trigger hate crimes in real life have emerged as serious global issues. The international community needs to work together to ensure that social media is used more responsibly. That's all we have for this week's The Point World Affairs. Thank you for tuning in and see you again next week.